The Secrets of Star Trek is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, episode 160. Captain DeBridge. Spock here. Make it so. Surrender is not an option. Attention crew of the Enterprise, this is James Kirk. We are all explorers, driven to know what's over the horizon, what's beyond our own shores. We would have helped you get home if you had asked. That's who Starfleet is. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing The Menagerie, Parts 1 and 2 of the original series. Joining me today on the panel are Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going, Dom? Very well, thanks. And Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Folks, uh, please be sure to join the StarQuest fan club by texting StarQuest to 66866. That's StarQuest to 66866. And then follow the instructions from there, and it'll get you all signed up for the StarQuest fan club. But first, we're talking about The Menagerie, Parts 1 and 2. Jimmy, can you give us a recap of what happens in this story? Thirteen years ago, just like in the movie Forbidden Planet, Captain Pike (laughs) and the Enterprise visited the planet Talos IV in search of survivors of a shipwreck. What they found was a dying society of powerful telepaths that could create illusions. The Talosians kidnapped Captain Pike and wanted to keep him in a world of illusions with Vina, a woman who was the sole survivor of the shipwreck, so they could play Adam and Eve. Vina had been hideously disfigured, but the Talosians used their illusion power to restore her beauty mentally. Pike refused to be a kept man, and they left the planet. Now, 13 years later, Captain Kirk and the Enterprise have been mysteriously diverted to Starbase 11, where Captain Pike is being housed after a disfiguring accident that has confined him to a wheelchair with a beeper. It turns out that the mysterious diversion was caused by Mr. Spock, who implements a secret and illegal plan to kidnap Captain Pike, commandeer the Enterprise, and take it back to the forbidden planet Talos IV, where he wants to deliver Captain Pike to the Talosians and their world of illusions. Spock puts the plan into effect, taking control of the Enterprise's computers to keep anyone from interfering with the plan, On the way to Talos, Spock is put on trial for mutiny by Commodore Mendez of Starbase 11, Captain Kirk, and the disabled Captain Pike. As part of the evidence in the trial, they start streaming video from Talos 4, which recorded the events of 13 years ago, and so they learn what originally happened to Captain Pike on the planet. Despite this, Kirk, Pike, and Mendez vote Spock guilty as charged and threaten him to increase the dramatic tension. But when they get to Talos IV, it turns out Mendez was never on board the ship. The Talosians were pranking us, and the trial was all a trick to keep Kirk from gaining control of the Enterprise too soon. Spock has been totally colluding with the Talosians the whole time, informing them of how to defeat Kirk. Also, all this got relayed to Starbase 11, and Mendez waives all the legal considerations including General Order 7 and Spock's legal charges so we can get a happy ending. Pike then beams down to live with Vina in a Talosian illusion. That about does it, yeah. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> this is, uh, I should point point out, I feel like I, some, I point this out a lot, but with the original series, we're going in production order. We're not going in the way it was originally aired or re-aired or anything like that. It just There are several different orders, and we're going in production orders. And these were the 15th and 16th episodes of this season. and it's it's the second court martial episode in a row in the production yeah. order, which is <laughs> yeah. interesting. And the reason we we get this two parter, which is I think the only two parter in all yes. of the original series, only one. Yep. yep. And the reason we get this is actually because they run out of scripts mid season, <laughs> and they, <laughs> the the and, and Broadenberry made the decision to reuse the pilot that they'd been shot never aired at that point, and to save money to mm-hmm. to fill two slots in this season. So that's a 
It's kind of interesting, but I think it's a successful. I think and fans yeah. generally agree it's this a, works. It's a great way to reuse footage that they already had. They already paid for it. Was rejected as a pilot, but it was still there. You know, it didn't take anything for them to splice it in. Mm-hmm. All they had to do was build the shell of this story about the Enterprise being hijacked by Spock and what happened with Captain Pike. And of course, they explain the fact that it's not the same actor. It's not Jeffrey Hunter playing Pike this time. Mm-hmm. It's another actor. By, oh, he was in this horrible accident that completely disfigured him, and the only thing that looks somewhat similar are his eyes, and even that, it's pretty clear it's not the same person, but still, right. close enough. Yeah. and it, it, Speaking of that, he's, I, I, so in the original pilot, it was Jeffrey Hunter, who played mm-hmm. Captain Pike, mm-hmm. in Discovery and in Strange New Worlds, it's Anson Mao. Mm-hmm. In the J.J. Abrams reboots, it's Bruce Greenwood. Yep. The man who's playing Captain Pike here is Sean Kenny, and it's it's clear that he's visually distinct. I mean, he's in the wheelchair, but mm-hmm. he's also miraculously turned from a brunette in the pilot to a blonde here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I just want to say, I mean, clearly the best of all of the Captain Pikes, <laughs> by far, is Sean Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just it's just the way he sits there with his mouth hanging open and the way his eyes occasionally move from one direction to another. He, there's just so much subtlety in his performance compared <laughs> to all the others. They're just so over the top. Yeah, but right. if you really want a subtle performance by Captain Pike, clearly Sean Kinney is the best. So, so you're saying this is how strange New World should be? It should be his adventures in the wheelchair? <laughs> yeah, I think that would be great. I mean, just imagine all the all the places that the Telosians could take him, all the strange new worlds their illusions could conjure up. Oh, the worlds you will go, the Susian Star Trek. <laughs> the actually, I was thinking about that. The Pike may have the most different actors playing him of any character in Star Trek. <laughs> if you if you think about it, I mean. We, We've had two Kirk, you know, Kirk actors and two, you know, Spocks and all that sort of stuff. Oh, I, no, Spock's going to beat him though. Spock has been played by more people. Leonard Nimoy is the classic, of course. Oh, mm-hmm. yep. But then we've had the Discovery Spock. We've had the reboot Spock. We've had the young Spock on the Genesis planet. That's right. We've had the young Spock in the animated series. We've had the young Spock in Discovery. Um, so that's at least six. Well, we've had, in fact, several uh, Spocks of different ages in the Genesis planet so, on the mm-hmm. search for yeah. Spock. So you, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I'm also glad they reused this because it gave the fans Mm -hmm. an expanded backstory and a glimpse into this other age Mm -hmm. on the Enterprise. If this had never been done, there would be, oh, yeah, there was this mythical pilot that was out there, but we've never seen it. It's never been released and stuff. But right from the beginning, the pilot, in in essence, with some edits, was released to fandom, and it was made canonical. Mm-hmm, so yeah. fans could always look back on this earlier era and imagine what it would have been like. We didn't have to wait till DVD to, to yeah. watch it, but go ahead. Or, or yeah. little clips to come out over time, as yeah. you know what happened from cutting room floors or whatever. But yeah. uh, it, it is interesting to look at the difference between the pilot. And, and, of course, we talked a little bit about that when we talked about the cage, you know, however long ago that was. A long but time there's ago. Yeah, <laughs> it's been a while. So you'll have to go back and listen to that probably. But... uh. It is this interesting to look at the differences of, of the words they would use and, of course, the design of the Enterprise and everything compared to what fans are used to because of what was actually used during the series. Yeah, uh, by the way, uh, the our discussion of The Cage is episode 20, so That's 140 just a episodes ago. ago. That's just it's a little while ago. Yeah, it's three years as we're recording this now. <laughs> so uh, time flies. Well, one of the things I want to point out is, is how they, they account for the this super detailed record that they're showing on the screen. Like, Because wow. a fan is going to sit there and go, how could we possibly be watching a recording of Pike on the planet in you know, mm-hmm. Telos 4 and all this sort of stuff? And so they have to account for that. And so they, they kind of say it's being, it's being streamed from Telos 4. The Telosians have a way of making a record that they've, they've sent to us. Yeah, but they, they set it up with lamely yeah they if if they wanted to explain it that way they could have waited till they beamed down to the planet to do the reveal of oh the telosians are sending us this stuff right they didn't they said no ship has it when we when we see the opening scene from the pilot <laughs> on the bridge of the enterprise they they're like wait no ship keeps records in that detail and i'm like 
why not? Yeah. <laughs> right. We're watching a TV show that keeps records in that detail in the 20th <laughs> century. Surely by the 23rd, you've got your closed circuit TVs recording everything. Yeah. And, I guess, yeah. And I would assume, although, yes, I know fans would have would have questioned this, but once they beam down, they've got little drone cams flying around yeah. them. Well, and that's, that's yeah. an argument that was made actually with... Uh, Picard, where it shows, or was it Nose Discovery, where they had that little that snippet of uh, Leonard Nimoy as Spock from uh, TNG on yeah. uh, what uh, reunif- reunification? Oh yeah, yeah, unification, unification part two. Part two. Mm-hmm. They had that little snippet, and, and you know, of course, they, all it was was Picard and, and Spock there. And it's like, oh, how how did they? How did the Federation get Starfleet get a hold of this record? And yeah, it's like they've got drone cams. They've got yeah, or, or the, com badges. Was yeah. was Mister Data there to witness it? Yeah, or the com badges. <laughs> you right, know, right. I mean, there's there's ways that that could be been done, but people had argued about how did this get this get into the the Starfleet records? Probably not that hard, you know, yeah, because I mean, it, they recorded it in TNG and they needed to reuse it for this show. Yeah, Star I records. know. And it was a good way to do a throwback <laughs> to fans. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So, um, I, I want to mention that we saw. So they describe how Pike gets injured, and mm-hmm. we also have. The Telosians show up in Discovery. So the second scene is a Discovery has both of those aspects of this. Uh, so and, and all of that takes place prior to original series, uh, but, but, but after, after the, the cage. After the cage. And uh, so it's interesting to think about the fact that Pike knew what was coming for him in the accident in the J-class starship and the yep. baffle plate. And we get we get to see that in the uh, episode through the Valley of Shadows in uh, in, in Discovery uh, mm-hmm. episode twelve of season two, and uh, well, so what do you think about how this how all of that affected how you saw this? Did it affect it at all? Did you think about Anson Mount in the coming Strange New Worlds, or did you just experience it as it's? Because Father Corey, this is your yeah. first time watching it, right? Yeah, yeah I, I, actually, I I'd, I'd watched Menagerie. I, I watched Menagerie after. Um, Discovery season ended. The the Mount season ended. The or the Pike okay. season ended. So I I went and watched this after that. But so this is the second time I've watched this. But I, I think it is interesting, and, and should mention too that that accident happened concurrent with TOS. It was this, it was only a couple of months before this right. episode. So you know before this event happened. So this would be concurrent with first season TOS basically in timeline. So that that's kind of you know kind of interesting that that it, it really is now they've discovery has shown something from the tos era specifically true but it was it, it just it it just kind of filled in the blank if you will of okay he was in this accident what happened you know and we know that he went back for these these cadets and everything and we got to see that that he went in there and he sat he basically tried or almost gave his life to save them you know, right. we, now we now we've seen that on screen you now instead of just in our imaginations. Jimmy, how about you? Did it affect? So well, it made me think about you know the Telosian stuff in season two of Discovery, mm-hmm. and of course I thought about the fact that yeah, when they go to to the Klingon monastery at Boreth to get a time crystal, Pike sees this vision and he's told if you take this time crystal, that future will be locked in. And so he makes the tragic decision to sacrifice himself in the future in order to get the time crystal they need right now. And that's a character revealing choice. And it was nice. I I don't I don't think it has it didn't have for me particularly I didn't really dwell on it in mm-hmm. rewatching this. It just occurred to me, yeah, that happened and that's an interesting character choice. Going forward, the interesting thing will be to see how do they deal with that in the Strange New World series. Right. Mm-hmm. Because are they going to play that up, which I think probably would be a mistake, or are they going to largely keep that in the background and uh, and focus on storytelling about going to Strange New Worlds? Right. right. I hope so. One of the things that, that came up to me from that season two of Discovery was when we saw the the Telosian episode, how Venus still and and those events still occupied Pike's mind. I mean, it was still mm-hmm. something he was he not yeah. dwelling on, but still something that was within him, and that which would explain why this was a course of action that he would. He didn't want Spock to to risk his life, but in the end, it's a course of action he would approve of and want. 
for some reason, that connection with Vina was made and and stayed with him. And I have a feeling we will hear about the whole the vision of the time crystals at some point in Strange New World. Yeah. That they're they're not going to leave that completely out of there. Mm. But I have a feeling it's going to be something that's going to be part of maybe one episode. I hope. I hope it'll be you know yeah. maybe it'll be part of one episode, uh, just kind of a, a flashback type of thing, and that'll be the end in of passing. it. Passing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't mind them mentioning it occasionally as long as they don't build it up into a big central pathos plot. No. Yeah. Uh, I do want to. Speaking of Strange New Worlds. I want to think I I would like the end of that series when it comes to be Pike passing on the Enterprise to Kirk. Yeah. Just, yeah, just that, that would be nice. That has to be how the se- the series ends eventually, but uh, just just uh, a thought. Uh so how does this change what we see here of the events of the cage? How is it changed from the pilot? I mean they, they do change some aspects of the original pilot. Yeah, they delete stuff for running time. Mhm. Mm-hmm. So like in the original pilot, like in the in the Mojave Desert horse room horse scene uh fantasy, we get more background on oh, this is where Captain Pike grew up. Right. You know. They cut that out for time. We got to see some additional aliens in other cages in the menagerie mm-hmm. that in the pilot that were then cut out for the menagerie part one and two. Right. So it's unfortunate we didn't get to see those. And then they they repurposed the ending. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In the original ending of the pilot, the Talosians show Captain Pike, Vina going back underground with an illusionary Captain Pike as a boy toy to keep her entertained. Mm-hmm. And so they're like, in the original pilot, they're showing that to Pike so he'll understand that she's got what she wants and she's going to be happy. And then that lets Pike go off to explore the stars, which is what he wants. Mm-hmm. In this, they don't show they they repurpose that piece of footage. So now it's they they didn't show the Talosian showing Pike Vina going underground. They took that same fo- that same footage, and now it represents the actual Captain Pike going in illusory form, going underground with Vina, and they show that to Captain Kirk to show him that Pike is getting what he wants now. Right, right. right. Uh, That's the biggest change in the footage. Other than, other than that, it's just deletions for runtime. Yep. Right, right. That is, yeah, that is the biggest the biggest difference. So uh, the, the one of the things the interesting things about this story is it's essentially, in, in some ways, it plays out again the same, the same circumstances in Search for Spock. Because in Search for Spock, Kirk and crew risk everything, including their careers, to steal the Enterprise and rescue Spock from a planet from which they've been forbidden to go. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. it's a, Genesis it's a, is planet forbidden, sure. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and, and they take him and he has revived, in a sense, uh, back on Vulcan. So th- it's, I, th- I thought it was an interesting thing that Kirk gets to return the favor to Spock that he did for... Or Pike eventually, you know, originally, which is what one of the things that that it gets me though is is our Spock's actions logical? Is Spock operating from emotion here? Well, yeah, um, but it, it's implied. I mean, and I had I in in watching this early on in the runtime, I said he's had to be in communication mm-hmm. with the Talosians to yes. set all this up. And so Spock has been breaking General Order 7 already. Um, the the um, uh, General Order 7, by the way, is under no circumstances shall any starship, even in extreme emergency, go to Talos 4 or have contact with it. Mm-hmm. And I like how when, um, when Commodore Mendez unzips the order so Kirk can read it, it's like it says at the bottom that, the previous starship to visit the planet was the Enterprise with Captain Christopher Pike and half Vulcan science officer Spock. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, wow, how racist. I mean, <laughs> Captain <laughs> Captain Pike. Not human. And not, yeah. <laughs> not, not Commander Spock or Lieutenant Spock or whatever he was, but half Vulcan science officer Spock instead of his rank. Yep. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's a... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, 
H- half so, Asian science officer. Yeah, yeah. that would be <laughs> really over the top. How about just lieutenant or whatever he was? Yeah. Um, but um, but Spock has clearly been in communication with the Telosians, and they they really hammer that point in part two. Where it's like, oh yeah, uh, Mr. Spock totally told us how to defeat you, Captain Kirk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so he's been breaking General Order 7. What we don't know is who made the first move. You know, mm-hmm. I would assume that the Telosians, because they're able to affect starships at great distance, yeah. mm-hmm. that they learned about Captain Pike's situation. And then they said, how can we help this guy? Mm hmm. And they then contacted Spock telepathically, and and they worked out this plan, because otherwise, I mean, it's, it's otherwise, how would Spock contact them if it wasn't them reaching out right. telepathically? Right. But that then raises a question of the logic of General Order Seven. Hmm. Mendez says this is the only death penalty left on our books. You go to Talos Four, or you talk with them, and you die. Okay, from one perspective, that can seem reasonable because these people, if they ever get off Talos IV, could severely endanger the stability of of governments galactically Mm -hmm. with their illusion power. But I don't know that this is a rational thing because it seems to me the thing that's keeping them on Talos IV is that's where they want to be. They can, can, as we see both in the pilot episode and in the menagerie, they can reach way far out into space and control starships through their illusion power. Right. If they wanted to get off of Talos IV, they could totally do that. Well, and they're they're yeah. reaching Starbase Eleven. It, you know, Mendez mm-hmm. yeah. wasn't even on the shuttlecraft in the first place. That was the that's where the illusion started is getting on the shuttlecraft in the first place. And they don't have to reach out to the Federation. They could use Romulans or Klingons who pro- presumably don't have a General Order Seven equivalent. On their books, yeah. or any other species that are out there, Gorn or whatever. Well, the one of the things that's interesting about the Telosians is that they are, in the end, they're a benevolent people. I mean, all of the bad things that they do to Pike is is waved off as a well. We oh, we just didn't understand human nature, which mm-hmm. the torturing bit is a little yeah you know, yeah. Uh, but but the idea is that they 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 generally want the best for Vina and Pike, and this is what yeah. they're doing. They also want an Adam and Eve. Uh, new race situation that because they're dying and they they want to colonize the surface of their planet mm-hmm. with um with new people and in the pilot they talk about we're going to bring up stuff from our underground gardens to to get more plant life up here and then right. you you will begin carefully guided lives and we're going to rebuild a situation mm-hmm. on the surface and it's implied that this is a slavery situation right. now they don't actually. They don't actually nail that down. They don't yeah. tell us how is this slavery, as opposed to just we're looking for people to recolonize. We're looking for colonists, basically. Mm-hmm. Right. We want to pass on some of our legacy, and we and we want some colonists. You, well, you could ask nicely if that's the case, but they don't really show us how. I mean, it's not like they're going to be doing forced labor. Yeah, is it? I mean, they don't communicate that. It's more like you're going to be living in a fantasy land. Mm-hmm where you can do whatever you want. And that's not exactly classical slavery. <laughs> but it does leave the uncomfortable possibility at the end of this one, well, wait, now that we've given them Captain Kirk, I mean, now that we've given them Captain Pike, yeah. now they're going to go ahead and create their slave mm-hmm. race. And I, I would argue, t- I'd argue, too, that the whole issue of, of living in the fantasy land, they feed off of those yeah. fantasies. I mean, so that that that's uh, in in a way that they're they're using those fa- that fantasy land. Oh yeah, you can live in this wonderful world. You can do whatever you want, go wherever you want, you know, virtually. But we get all the benefit from it for our feeding. Mm, that's true. I, I I wonder how damaged Pike is, and whether he's even capable of having well, kids at that point. But yeah, yeah, but they don't tell us one way or another. They don't. I mean, they say this is what the Telosians want, and it looks like they're getting what they want. It's true. Right? It's true. Also, they put uh, they put um, Vina back together after the crash. That's mm-hmm. true. R- ridiculously saying that they couldn't put her back together right because they'd never seen a human being, except for all the memories they were reading out of her mind. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, they made an illusion that looked right. So, um, yeah. Yeah. 
Right. <laughs> and I would assume after the crash, some computer record of something had to have survived somewhere. If she survived, has... something had to survive, right. Yeah. Uh, right. Also, I I wanted to comment, so, you know, this doesn't age particularly well in terms of the technology. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The chair technology in particular is ridiculous. Yeah. Because it's, he's got a, Captain Pike has a neural link with the chair that allows him to move forward and back, okay, and turn and stuff. And okay, that's fine. You know, we, we have primitive neural links now. Mm-hmm. We could do that. But his neural link only allows him to beep a a light yeah. once for yes, twice for no. And no, we can do better than that now. Yeah. Yeah. Stephen um, Hawking proved that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, but even then, I mean now Stephen Hawking didn't have a neural link. Yeah. Like, you know, Elon Musk is doing. But we have ways, of, we have better ways of reading reading your brain states now that allow you to communicate more than yes or no. Also, there's a line in there where uh, Kirk becomes convinced that Pike could not have sent the message to call the Enterprise to Starbase 11 because since he can only do yes or no beeps or number numbers <laughs> of beeps, mm-hmm. he has no way to uh, to ask for this. And it's like, oh, Captain Kirk, you do not know the history of the early spiritualist movement in the 1800s when the Fox sisters first made contact with Mr. Splitfoot. Everything was communicated through numbers (laughs) of raps that were based on the letters of the alphabet. And it was tedious. It was the most tedious, boring mediumship ever. (laughs) Well, let's just use something as simple as, you know, Morse code. He couldn't beep, 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 you know. (laughs) Right, right. So uh, one of the it, a funny moments is just kind of passes quickly is and I think it's maybe a directorial thing when Kirk is in Mendez's office uh, early on in the first episode and there's uh, Miss Miss Piper I think is is Mendez's yeah. secretary and she's uh, Kirk smiles at her in his charming way that he does and she says oh I've heard all about you from a mutual friend and then she names the friend. And it's awesome to watch Kirk's smile just kind of fade as the realization of what this, who this friend was. I'm like, what did you do, Kirk? You yeah. had. <laughs> that was a really good moment. I, I really like that uh, addition to the a little bit there, but it's a really Kirk character moment. I, I also like how on Starbase 11, even though it's the 23rd century, we have doors that work on hinges. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. so you don't have the automatically opening doors like you do on the Enterprise. You, Commodore <laughs> Mendez has to yank open a door like a caveman or something. Wow. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, th- so a little bit more about Spock. Uh, Kirk at one point says Spock can, can no more be disloyal to his former commander or his present commander than not breathe. and. Of course, the obvious question is there: What if those loyalties conflict? Like he doesn't address that, but mm-hmm. but and that that's the crux of this story is the conflicting loyalties. Spock is absolutely loyal to Kirk, but he's also absolutely loyal to Pike, and mm-hmm. I like seeing that in, in that part of Spock's personality is this history he has. I also and and it's clear. Oh, Captain Pike takes precedence because mm-hmm. he totally throws Kirk under the Talosian bus. Yeah, right. Um, but. I I like how, or I find it interesting how in Mendez's office early on, after it's been revealed, okay, nobody sent you this command to come here. So, and Mr. Spock was the only one who heard it. So maybe he just lied. Mm -hmm. Um, And Kirk is, Kirk starts overacting, talking (laughs) about how (laughs) someone is interfering with my command, whether it's Spock or someone else, I don't care. Someone is interfering with my command and I don't like it. Okay, yeah, someone sent a message. Let's let's walk this down a few notches. <laughs> but McCoy happens to be there for the outburst, mm-hmm. and McCoy gets in Kirk's face and yeah. totally stands up for Spock. <laughs> and this is great coming from the fact that, you know, normally McCoy and Spock have this rivalry. Mm-hmm. And you would think McCoy would be the last person to defend him. But in fact, he's the first person to defend him. He def- he's he has more faith in Spock than Kirk does, and yes. and it is great to see that. He he also says the 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 biggest lie in Star Trek is that Vulcans are incapable of lying. Yeah, <laughs> which exactly. we talked about most recently in in Enterprise with Tafal, but it comes up again you know for the first time here is you know, Spock's incapable of lying. 
That is not exactly true. <laughs> I, mean, <and laughs> so, I, I, I did. I really like McCoy. I mean, he was very in here, very little. He, he had very little yeah. to do in this. But like you, you mentioned, standing up for that, and then when McCoy is given the the choice whether or not to have Spock arrested as the senior officer on the bridge, yep. you could see he's conflicted. He really doesn't yeah. want to do it, but he goes, "Yeah, we better do this. It will confine you to quarters work." You know, he's got his <laughs> yeah, little yeah. quip out. Well, just confine you to quarters be enough? Yeah, but it well, was. It, it, yeah, in fact, it wasn't enough because that, that's exactly yeah. what Spock wanted because he needed to do more in order to keep his plane going. Yep, he should have been in the brig. Yeah. So, yeah, Kirk forces Spock's hand by following the Enterprise in a shuttlecraft until the, Spock oh, has no choice but to stop and save him. Stupidly, mm. this ship is not equipped to make the voyage to Talos. They know the Enterprise is faster than they are. How... how you're just risking your life foolishly if you take off in a ship that doesn't have a gas tank big enough to get you to Talos <laughs> mm-hmm. or enough oxygen on yeah. board. And and because even after they run out of fuel, it's like, oh, we've got two hours of oxygen left, and then we're dead if the Enterprise doesn't stop. <laughs> and that's just dumb. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Surely a starbase has a ship capable of at least reaching this star system they know right. the Enterprise is going to. Another yeah. starship, of, you know, well, it doesn't have to be the Enterprise kind, but another one, yeah. They didn't have the, the roundabout class yet, that, not until DS9, so... Roundabout. No, they, <laughs> they also have a, have a bunch of ginned-up courtroom drama between Kirk and Mendez where they're kind of jousting with each other and use Captain Pike as the tiebreaker on a few occasions. Yes. Mm-hmm. I find it interesting, after they realize the images are coming... Are, that are streaming on their screen are coming from Talos 4 instead of a data bank on ship. They're like, okay, this is violating General Order 7 because we're in communication with Talos 4. And Spock is like, you have no choice. The keeper has taken control of your screen. And I'm going, you could leave the room. Yeah. <laughs> right. Now, now maybe the keeper can cause you to see all this anyway, but at least you'll it will be an, an earnest of your desire to do the Imperial will and not communicate with Talos 7. Yeah. The explosions control the horizontal and the vertical. <laughs> <laughs> they, they've reached the outer limits, yeah. <laughs> so uh, the other thing I noticed is, this is really a cage observation, but the whole plot, the Vena plot about being in this uh, fantasy world after she's crashed on a planet, this bears a lot of resemblance to season three of Discovery and the whole Kelpian in the crashed ship thing with the mm-hmm. holograms. Uh, and it, I thought that was... Interesting. Hmm. I, I wish I'd thought of it then when we were talking about that in season three of Discovery, but, or maybe I didn't. I just don't remember the hmm. memory goes. But it's interesting the, to see that idea reused in a slightly repackaged in that way. There's only a certain number of sci fi concepts that can be brought into conjunction with each other. You're going to see repeats like that. And they, yeah. they've, they've had concepts like this before. TNG, there was that episode where they move the people from one plan to another and use the holodeck to simulate a journey from the one biome right. to the other. You know, right. So they, they've used yeah. that kind of concept before. It, essentially, essentially what the, what the Telosians have to offer is a holodeck. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mental yes, holodeck. The <laughs> early, or uh, as the, the original story that Roddenberry was cribbing from for the cage was uh, a different show. Wasn't, wasn't Star Trek, but it was an un, unproduced script for a different sci-fi show that he called it the transporter, which is kind of funny. The the mm. whole idea of a fantasy, creating a fantasy world that's indistinguishable from reality. Uh, so we, now we know where that word came from. Mm. Uh, so Spock is caught up in, so the whole plot kind of hinges on a captain is responsible for everything that happens on board his ship that, that comes out in the trial. and up, up to a point, Lord Copper. Yeah. Well, it, not, I mean, even today, you know, if 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 a, if the captain is no, asleep no, 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 in his no, no. cabin, if if, yeah. if if a crewman if a crewman on a on a modern ship goes off and commits murder, they're not going to put the captain to death because it happened on his watch. No, but the captain will could lose his command, be demoted, which is what they're saying here is what only, Mendez, the faux Mendez, says. See, I, I would argue only if he the captain didn't act or was complicit. You know, if, if Kirk if Kirk had said, oh, well, Spock is leading us to tell us for I'm not going to do anything about it, then, yes, he would be complicit. Or if he said, well, we're not going to have a trial, we're not going to hold him responsible, or I'm going to help him do it, then I would agree. Now, that, that was just that was to ramp up the drama that you're going to lose yeah. your career because yeah. of this. No, 
No, Kirk Kirk acted exactly as he's supposed to to try to uh, make Spock hold responsibility for the situation. If an XO of a U.S. Navy submarine takes over the ship and, dri- and drives it to uh, a Chinese Navy base, that captain is done. <laughs> Unless the captain is actively working to stop him. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's that's a whole nother dramatic unless, thing. Unless, like unless, unless the captain Clancy. jumps into a, unless the captain jumps into a, a fishing boat and follows him, and, <laughs> he's, he's and they stop the sub. Him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that would be. Um, so by the end, the the Telosians stop transmitting. Spock's hang is left hanging, convicted uh, until they get to orbit. And as you mentioned, Jimmy, we get this nice convenient wrap up so that spock doesn't have to leave the show and go to, to prison yeah uh the general order seven is temporarily suspended because of everybody loves pike and therefore we're going to do yeah, this special the thing to- to him. netflix was really great yeah <laughs> yes it's a streaming series yes <laughs> Telosian plush uh so <laughs> yeah, um, talos and- talos plus talos yeah, plus yes uh, so, uh, and it, they got the one without the ads. So what do you think of, uh, this any, or anything left to say about this father Corey? Uh, one thing I got a kick out of, of course, you know, reusing sets, the computer center was really just the enterprise engineering set with more yeah. computers put in it. I got a yes. kick out of that. And then just something that's, you know, kind of a quirk of, uh, the streaming services. So I watched this on prime and they gave it a rating rating of 13 plus because of drug use and violence. Oh yeah, Netflix had it as um, sex and fear. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Okay. It, it, so it's, it's pretty tame. <laughs> it's really strange when you watch these these streaming services. Don't trust their ratings because they they take they're really hypersensitive. Odd, I, I they're yeah. hypersensitive. And I I wonder if there's some AI involved in it too. Yeah, <laughs> it's very strange. And speaking of the computer center, that's actually another thing I wanted to mention was uh, Spock knocks out the two computer techs and then transmits the fake orders to Enterprise and says, we're leaving an hour. Like, how long are these guys going to be out? Long <laughs> how long is a fucking neck pinch knock a guy out? <laughs> but, uh, how about you, Jimmy? Any uh, last thoughts? So just as looking at it from a writing point of view, it's interesting how they work the commercial breaks into this. Mm-hmm. Like at one point, Pike gets tired, so the Telosians shut off the streaming for now so he can rest. And really, it's just so we can have a commercial break. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> and another time, the Telosians, up for no reason, abruptly stop transmitting. And Mendez says, oh, it looks like the Telosians have abandoned you. And Spock is like, wait, what's going on? And it's really, again, just so we can preserve dramatic tension over a commercial break. And then once we're back from the commercial break, Spock is like, knows, okay, now you're going to get the answer you want. Right. Also, even though we said we weren't going to comment really on the um, the material from the original pilot that much, there was one moment that just leapt out at me when it, it it's towards the end of the pilot where number one is taking a landing party down, including Mr. Spock and <laughs> Ensign Colt or whatever her name is. And they go to beam down and only number one and Ensign Colt dematerialize mm-hmm. and as soon as they're gone mr spock says the women yeah <laughs> and, and it, there's just something about the way leonard nimoy i mean yes they are women that was the distinguishing characteristic so it's not illogical <laughs> to point out that the women are the ones who have who have gone down and all of the men have been left mm-hmm. so it's not illogical but there's just something about the way leonard nimoy <laughs> delivers that line that i find hilarious I, yeah. I i like to imagine spock sitting there in the uh in the hearing room like cringing at all of his like uh, the, the 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 laughing at the uh the the tinkling plants and all yeah, of yeah. his other his his yelling of orders Sc- scanners on yeah <laughs> oh <laughs> there so so to to mention a little bit more uh context of that kind of stuff so in the in the original pilot spock does not yet have the emotionless persona Mm -hmm. That's number one, Mm -hmm. and who is a human woman. And Mr. Spock doesn't yet have that. He has the exotic alien thing, but he's not yet Mr. Emotionless. And so we do get to see him like when they're when they're touching the blue Chinese money singing plant. He's and he's smiling and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And he's showing emotion. 
And and so there, you know, was this question about, well, why would Spock be so out of character back then? I mean, what's the in-universe reason mm-hmm, for right. why he would be out of character? And then why would he take on number one's persona? And uh, I forget the the writer who did it, but in the short track, Q&A, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. which is about Mr. Spock's first day on the Enterprise with number one, they essentially hint at that, and they show him and her bonding, and she gives him career advice to lay off on showing other people his emotions if he wants command and things mm-hmm. like that. And so it it kind of explains how his character arc is set up with becoming more emotionless in his presentation over time. Right. Also, though, I really liked when he, it, you know, Leonard Nimoy had a, had a tendency to shout his lines early in the series, mm-hmm. you know, because he's like in thinking of, you know, 18th century sailing ships where you <laughs> had to bark out the order really yeah. loud if you wanted the crew to hear. And so, so when in Q and A, he, he beams on the Enterprise and it's like, Ensign Spock reporting as ordered, sir. And the first thing number one says to him is, no need to shout, Mr. Spock. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wonder, what would you guys think about if they ever remade the cage using Anson Mount and Rebecca Romaine and, and, and I was, Ethan Putt? I was Putt. thinking about that because, of course, they could use the same actress for Vina and, and things like that. Yeah. And, you know, the same actress for the Telosians and everything. I was thinking about that. It would be kind of interesting if they ever decided to do that, you know, using the modern yeah. modern sets and everything. I, I think... I think it'd be actually, I'd, assuming I'd they followed the same basic script and maybe cleaned it up a little bit, I think it would actually yeah. be pretty good. It would be interesting to see. The problem is that it would cost a couple million bucks. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it, would, it's, it would be a big deal to do that. But I wonder. I mean, it doesn't look like they're doing short tracks now. So. Which is too bad, because I enjoyed yeah. those. The, yeah. There were some really all. fun ones. And they, some of them yeah. weren't greatest, but some of them were really good. Some of them were really funny. <laughs> the, yeah. But the, the uh, triples one was awesome. But uh, yeah, it would be, I'd be in for that. All right. So I think that about does it for this time. This was uh, I, I, one of my favorites, but in my memory, uh, th- this was always one of my favorites because it was so interesting uh, as a kid seeing this and, and something that I'd never seen before. So uh, it was good. All right, let's take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Trek, including Alice C., Leah M., Melanie S., Sean S., and Luis M. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue The Secrets of Star Trek and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. And we'd also like to thank Victor Lambs, who edits the show for us every week. So that's it from us. What do you think of The Menagerie, parts one and two? You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash trek or our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Media, or send an email to trek at sqpn.com. We'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the movie Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. And we can see uh, the sound of music come alive. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the great actor from The Sound of Music. Until then, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Star Trek. Julie Andrews is not in Undiscovered Country. <laughs> <laughs> she, you can see her doing uh, Shakespeare in the original Klingon. And <laughs> Father Corey Stiga, thank you as well. <laughs> Thanks, Dom. And yeah, I was going to say that line about the Klingon. So. <laughs> <laughs> and once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Star Trek on Star Quest. And remember, sometimes a man will tell his bartender things he'll never tell his doctor. I mean, that's the best line in both <laughs> scripts. <laughs>